I have the pleasure of introducing Bill Haley to you. So as you probably gathered, I kind of care about this world of spiritual formation and spiritual direction, and I really care about this world of justice and mercy, but generally they are placed in um, polar opposites. And so wrong, right? They need to be overlapping and informing each other and saturating each other. And when I met Bill Haley, I was like, what? Someone like you exists and an organization like yours exists. Um, so I don't know if y'all are familiar with Coracle in Northern Virginia. It's a ministry where these two worlds come together. And we have, we put in your little um, packets just a, a folleto. What's a folleto? A pamphlet um, for you to read about the Coracle. Um, Bill is also the associate rector, an associate rector at the Falls Church. So most of us are familiar with the Falls Church, and he um, preaches there and serves there, and um, he's always trying to figure out how to sneak in um, truths of the kingdom and God's heart for justice and mercy in pretty much every sermon he preaches. Every time I hear him talk about something he's going to preach, I'm like, you're just preaching the same thing over and over and over again. Yep, yep. <laughs> It works for me. So come, Bill. It's such a joy to have you here. Thank you. And let me pray for him. Mm. Father, thank you for Bill. Thank you mm. for his faithfulness and that he has this heart to bring these two different worlds that are so close in your own heart. Thank you for what you have done through the stream of Anglicanism and history and the body of Christ and we want to learn, we want to be encouraged, not just about Anglicanism, but mostly just that you have been faithful over the centuries, over the decades, over the years. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So I'm so glad that Christine mentioned that, you know, we had this title of this conference. Um, for the most part, you know, the Matthew 25 gathering, an Anglican gathering, justice and mercy contending for shalom, and that each of us are taking one of those phrases. And so Christine just talked about gathering, and uh, David Hanke is going to talk about justice and mercy, and Samuel will talk about shalom, and Cliff will talk about contending, and I drew the short straw <laughs> and uh, get to talk about Anglican. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> All right. Well, I've been an Anglican for 20 years now, and so given my preponderance of gray hair and the diminishing amount of it, I guess that tells you that I found my way home to this Christian tradition as an adult. Or more accurately, God led me to it, and it felt like home upon arrival. I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Wheaton, Illinois. Some of you probably know what that means. Not surprisingly, I grew up in a conservative evangelical home. And then in college, I was wonderfully formed in a very reformed Baptist church. And then I became exposed to and involved in the inner city of America and saw poverty really for the first time and began to understand the systems of inequity and injustice that are all too operative in America. And then right after seminary in the mid-90s, I had the opportunity to travel literally around the world for 18 months. And I became exposed to, uh, to real crushing poverty and involved with it there. And I saw the even darker systems of injustice and oppression that typifies so much of our globe. I took that trip with a Bible and a backpack and a Sony Walkman. <laughs> yes, a Sony Walkman. <laughs> and tapes. And I, I, took a, I took that Bible on that trip because I had to see what the Bible had to say about what I was seeing. And it says a lot. 
And by the end of the journey, having seen so much, I knew with crystal clarity what kind of Christian tradition I wanted to be in. I just didn't know if it existed. I wanted to be in a Christian tradition that upheld the authority of Scripture and submitted to it, that recognized the value of beauty in worship, that was open to mystery, that would allow me to ask real questions without being looked at with suspicion, that really believed the church existed before 1517, <laughs> would allow me to connect with and even submit to Christians in the developing world, and would allow me to be passionate about justice without being branded a liberal, precisely because it took the whole Bible seriously. I just described Anglicanism, right? Though I didn't know it then. But within a couple of months after returning, God led me like a laser beam to the Falls Church Episcopal outside of Washington, D.C. in 1996. I literally had never stepped foot inside an Episcopal church. You have to remember my upbringing, right? Those Episcopalians, we're not even sure they're Christians, right? <laughs> But I walked into this Episcopal church by being led there by God, and I met John Yates, and two weeks later, I was hired as the director of outreach. And in this evangelical Episcopal church, I found my home of Anglicanism. And 10 years later, I was ordained. It can take a while for a Baptist to feel okay wearing collars and robes, and, and perhaps even longer to submit, at least in my case. And as you know from your story, and our stories, stuff happened. And the Falls Church Episcopal became the Falls Church Anglican. And that's actually a helpful transition in language when we consider our own heritage and our own inheritance. The Anglican tradition has many heroes of the faith who, at the same time, are heroes of the deed. Men and women who are committed to Christ, serious about the scripture, earnest in prayer, and passionate about both mercy and justice in the, and in their society and who are Anglicans. And you know many of them quite well. We could talk long about early opponents of slavery and the slave trade like John Newton and John Wesley. We could talk longer about William Wilberforce, the great abolitionist of the 1700s and the early 1800s in Britain, whose efforts led not only to the ending of slavery in Britain, but also the abolition of the slave trade decades before it ended in the United States, and it happened through his efforts without a civil war. You've heard of Wilberforce's friends who became known as the Clapham sect because they lived in a community in Clapham, right? Henry Thornton, Hannah Moore, John Venn, Granville Sharp, and others, all of them Anglicans. And these men and women explicitly spoke out for and they protested about and they acted on behalf of the poor and the oppressed, whether they were talking about slavery in their own country, the heinous slave trade in another country, atrocities in India, or many domestic injustices of their day, like unjust labor laws and inadequate provision of education for children. They did not merely talk about engaging their world, they absolutely did it in their specific historical context. And they engage their world by working on specific issues in their city, in their country, in their world. Why? Because they were a biblical people. They were a prayerful people. They kept their eyes open to the reality of the world around them. We could talk long about another Anglican who took on the mantle of William Wilberforce in the mid-1800s in Britain, Anthony Ashley Cooper, better known as Lord Shaftesbury. He took advantage of his aristocratic and political status to work for over 60 years for the underprivileged of London, basically because he believed that God loved people whom he had created with dignity, each one, and he was concerned about the eternity of all people. And so in the awful conditions of working class in Victorian England, through his efforts, child labor was eliminated that's impressive. Labor laws were reformed. Coal mines were regulated. Schools were set up to help street kids, and a number of other reforms were passed, and, and so many helping organizations were established. Now, it is noteworthy, my brothers and sisters, that it was the evangelicals who led the Anglicans in justice, right? 
It was the evangelicals who led the Anglicans for justice and mercy in their society. In the 20th century, we could talk, that's, that's, that's England in the 19th century, right? In the 20th century, we could talk long about Sam Shoemaker, the priest whose heart was so broken for people trapped in addiction that he founded Alcoholics Anonymous. We could talk long about Jonathan Daniels, the seminarian, the civil rights worker who lost his life in 1965 when he stepped between a white man with a shotgun and a little black girl named Ruby Sales. Speaking of Anglican martyrs, we could talk long about, about Janani Lawum, the Archbishop of Uganda in the 1970s, who stood up to political abuses and the oppressions of Idi Amin. And he was killed. And it's his feast day that we remember today. Well, speaking of Africa, we could talk long about Anglicans who have made an enormous impact for justice and racial reconciliation by talking about leaders like John Rusihana, the Bishop of Rwanda, leading reconciliation work after the 1994 genocide. Or we could talk about the Anglican church leaders helping broker the end of apartheid in South Africa. We're talking about Africa and Anglicans and justice and mercy. Well then, we could very long talk about the heroic efforts of Bishop Munir Annis right now, right now trying to assist with Syrian refugees and refugees from other war-torn regions. We could talk long about the statements from the Global South Anglican leaders that almost always have something to say about, about the turmoil that has been our denominational history for the last 10 years. But just as frequently, they will also have something to say that challenges the injustices in their own context, though these words garner far less attention on our side of the pond. These things are present day. And if we're talking about the present day and Anglicans and justice, well, then we could talk long about Gary Haugen, the founder of the International Justice Mission and an Anglican. We could talk long about Stephen Bowman, the current president of World Relief and an Anglican. We could talk long about Todd Dethridge, the founder of the Telos Group, um, who's going to be speaking with us tomorrow, peacemaker in Israel and Palestine and an Anglican. We could talk about Sammy De Pasquale, who we'll heal from tomorrow, showing compassion to immigrants on our southern border, and an Anglican. And my brothers and sisters, the gathered, the gathered at this Anglican gathering. If we're talking about the present day and Anglicans and justice and mercy, well, then we could talk long about each of you. Every one of us gathered here on February 17th 2016 in Austin for this conversation. That's why you're here. That's why you're invited, because you've read the Bible carefully, and you know that God is a God of justice and a God of mercy. You know his heart. You love the people that he loves. You've lived the life. You've walked the talk, and each of you have been drawn to this tradition, which, as Christian has said, has a place for you and has for centuries. So, I hope we get to talk long. And these next three days are a start. And if we're talking about Anglicans and justice and mercy, then there is no way that we cannot talk about one man, and we should talk a little longer about him. We should talk a little longer about John Stott. John Stott is the godfather of biblical orthodoxy for the evangelical tradition, and he's an Anglican. It's a longer conversation, but I think a strong case could be made that, the, that without John Stott, the Anglican church in North America would not exist, and that most of us here would have either moved on from Anglicanism or would have never joined it at all. That's a longer conversation. But it was Stott who made sure that the social concern for justice and for mercy, based on the clear teachings of the scripture, was on the agenda for the historic gathering of evangelical Christians in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1974, and that it would find prominent language in the final version of the Lausanne Covenant, the very famous Lausanne Covenant, basically the, the Evangelicals Creed. That was Stott's doing. And he was working hard to fix a wrong. He would write 10 years later, from the 1920s to the 1970s, do we have this on a slide, Adrian? 
From the 1920s to the 1970s, evangelicals were preoccupied with the task of defending the historic biblical faith against the attacks of theological liberalism and reacting against its social gospel. But now we are convinced that God has given us a social as well as evangelistic responsibilities in his world. Yet, half a century of neglect has put us far behind in this area. We have a long way to go to catch up. In another book, he would write, Authentic Christian mission is a comprehensive activity which embraces evangelism and social action and refuses to let them be divorced. This polarization has been a disaster. And in another book, he would write, The cross is a revelation of God's justice as well as of his love. That's why the community of the cross should concern itself with social justice as well as with loving philanthropy. It's never enough to have pity on the victims of injustice if we do nothing to change the unjust situation itself. Good Samaritans will always be needed to succor those who are assaulted and robbed, yet it would be even better to rid the Jerusalem-Jericho road of brigands. Just so as Christian philanthropy in terms of relief and aid is necessary, long-term development is better. And we cannot evade our political responsibility to share in changing the structures which inhibit development. He's not just talking about some country over there, is he? Christians cannot regard with equanimity the injustices which spoil God's world and demean his creatures. Injustice must bring pain to the God whose justice flared brightly at the cross, and it should pain God's people too. Contemporary injustices take many forms. They are international. The invasion and annexation of foreign territory. They are political, the subjugation of minorities. They are legal, the punishment of untried and unsentenced citizens. They are racial, the humiliating discrimination against people on the ground of race or color. They are economic, the toleration of gross north-south inequality and the traumas of poverty and unemployment. They are sexual, the oppression of women. They are educational, the denial of equal opportunity for all or religious, the failure to take the gospel to the nations. Now that's an Anglican talking, right? That's us. That's our people. And that needs to characterize the Anglican church in North America if we are going to actually be Anglican, if we're going to be wise stewards of our inheritance. But brothers and sisters, more so, and so much more importantly, more so, we are gathered here, and all of ACNA, we don't want to be people of justice because we want to be Anglican. <laughs> no, we want to be people of justice because we are the people of the book, right? We are the people of God, and specifically the God who has revealed himself in the Holy Scripture. We are the people of the book that has over 2,000 references to the poor, we are a people of God who are committed to be like God through Christ. Love, the Bible says. Why? Because God is love, right? Be holy, the Bible says. Why? Because God is holy. Forgive, the Bible says. Why? Because God forgives. Be merciful, the Bible says. Why? Because God is merciful. Do justice. Why? because God is a God who does justice, because he's just. So we talk a lot about the call to Christians to be loving, to be forgiving, to be merciful, to be holy, and we should, because God is. Well, these three days we're talking about justice and mercy, and we should, because God does. Among those 2,000 references, here's one from Psalm 146, the Lord executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. Friends, if God does justice, God's people get to. It's our calling because it's in God's nature. 
And when we work for justice, we are doing God's work in the world. We're being biblical Christians, and we're being Anglicans worthy of the name. So from these reflections tonight, I only ask one thing. And it's a very small thing. Very small. It's a word of only two letters that I ask you to remember and hold dear and a small word that can guide us. This past January, just three weeks ago, I attended the Summit for Life near Washington, D.C. It was sponsored by the ACNA, my diocese, of, I'm sorry, my ACNA Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic and Anglicans for Life, our denomination's leading pro-life organization. And it's a really good organization, thanks be to God that we've got it. And it was a really good summit. It was really important. <laughs> and unfortunately, as always, it was really relevant. And it was convened to consider our call to protect unborn human life and to value the dignity of each life at the end of life. And these things matter. Our ACNA knows that they matter, and so they have put this clearly in our canons. And this summit was a direct action to help us be faithful to one of our canons in particular, Canon 2.8.3. All members and clergy are called to protect and respect the sanctity of every human life from conception to natural death. And so we spent the morning talking about the value of human life up to, up to, up from, from conception to birth. And, and we talked about how to push back the evil that is abortion, and it is evil. And then we had lunch, and then in the afternoon, we heard about end-of-life issues and natural death. Premature death, however you slice it, is also evil. It is. And throughout the day, my mind kept circling back to that small word in the middle, two. T.O. Two. What happens after a person is born? And then between all the way to their natural death. We are Anglicans. We care about the two. We are people of the book. We care about the two because our God cares about the two. God wants every human being alive at any age born, unborn, young, a little older, middle-aged, old, older still, elderly. He wants them to be who he's made them to be, to live into his design for them specifically, and to be with real relationship with him through Christ, to flourish, to know his shalom, to be a maker of shalom for the sake of his kingdom. That's what God wants for every human life at every stage of life. And so as Anglicans second, and as people of the book first, we care about the two. We are pro-life before a person is born, after they're born, for their whole life, and we fight against anything that threatens their being able to be who God made them to be. And as we all know, there are lots of threats. So as Anglicans second, and as people of the book first, the people of God, we are concerned. We are concerned about refugees. We're concerned about community development. We're concerned about homelessness. We are concerned about immigration. We are concerned about racial justice and reconciliation. We are concerned about human trafficking. We are concerned about at-risk youth and education. We are concerned about hunger. We are concerned about creation care. We are concerned about women before they've had a baby, after they've had a baby, and, and, that, and for that baby, after that baby's born. We are concerned with people for special needs and disabilities. We are concerned about those afflicted with, with poor mental health. We are concerned with those who enslaved to addiction and substance abuse. We are concerned about peacemaking. We are concerned about the sanctity of life. We are against abortion, and we are for adoption and foster care. We are concerned about people in prison prison ministries, and the system that perpetuates mass incarceration, especially of African-American men. We are concerned about this. As Anglicans, and more so as Christians, we are consistently pro-life. We've got to be. 
to be faithful to our Anglican heritage. We've got to be to be faithful to the book that we call our guide. We've got to be to be faithful to the God in whom we believe. We've got to be in order to fulfill our vocation to be the presence of Christ in the world. We've got to be consistently pro-life. And my bishop, John Guernsey, gets this. He convened that summit for life in Washington that I mentioned. And two weeks later, he wrote this, reflecting on Lent and, and Isaiah 58, which we already had read. You know, there are two passages that just make this bird fly. There's Isaiah 58 on the one wing, and there's Matthew 25 on the other, right? I don't know where it's flying, but those are the wings. <laughs> Christine's going to tell us where it's flying. Actually not. She's going to guide us in listening to help us discern, right? Right? So he was, my bishop John Guernsey was reflecting on Isaiah 58. It's a treasured passage for us, and he wrote this. This is just a week, you know, two weeks after the Summit for Life, right? He says, the prophet Isaiah points us to the importance of fasting with a rightful humility that manifests itself in concern for the poor. Amen. Amen? Amen. 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 This is the group I can get that amen from. (laughs) I'm used to having silence on that point. Please give me an amen. 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 So if that summit for life in the north three weeks ago in Washington focused on the commitments in our canons calling all Anglicans in North America to protect and respect the sanctity of every human life, and it focused on life from conception to birth and then at the end of life to a natural death, hmm? if that's the summit for life in the north, Focusing on those two things, I'd like to think of our gathering here in Austin as the summit for life in the South. Focusing on that small word, too. The summit for life in the South. Focusing on that small word, too. That's what we're here to talk about, learn about, pray about, be together with, be strengthened for, as God has called each one of us, and to discern what it means for us as Christians and specifically as Anglicans, and more specifically than that, for the Anglican Church in North America. We've got a great God with us. We've got so many people that he loves who need to know him, and need to know that he loves them. We've got a calling. We've got a great and a mighty heritage, and this is what we do. Because we are followers of Jesus the Christ. Because we are Anglicans. So let's turn our eyes to the one that we follow. Let's stand together. Just take a minute of quiet as we prepare to worship.